All right, perfect. So good evening, good afternoon, good day, and good morning from wherever you may be tuning in from across the world. And welcome to the second of our World Milk and Chocolate monthly webinars, uh, aptly titled the Boring and Cross Borders Expert Insight into Securing Finance from Abroad. Um, for, for those of you that I haven't had the chance to speak to just yet, whether it be over a Zoom call or just via email, um, my name is Jack Bailey and I'm the growth manager here at, at Milk Chocolate Property. And tonight I'm lucky enough to be joined by the other gentleman on your screen, um, Adam Kingston uh, from Australian Expat Finance uh, to talk about all things securing finance from abroad um, when looking to enter the Australian property market. So throughout the next hour or so, I'll be asking Adam a raft of questions who in turn will then offer some specialized insight into firstly, how to secure finance from abroad, but on a more micro level, what lenders are currently favoring and lending to expats, what those lenders do and don't like to see in applications, LBRs, interest rates, and, and so on. Um, usually after this, we would be answering some questions that were presented to us prior via email, but there weren't too many. Um, so we'll try and get the webinar somewhat conversational. And if you have any questions as we go on, um, throw them into the Q&A section, which should be down there, and we'll, uh, we'll answer at the end. Uh, now, before launching into this evening's proceedings and, and uh, the webinar, there's just a few housekeeping matters that um, I will quickly address first and foremost, and probably most importantly, any advice given throughout this webinar is strictly advice of a general nature. Secondly, as mentioned above, we, will, uh, we welcome any and all questions, and if we can't answer them, uh, all at the end. Whilst we're conducting our Q&A, we'll endeavour to get back to you personally after um, the webinar. Uh, and thirdly, this webinar is being recorded and I'll endeavour to get that out in the next 24 hours uh, or so. So um, uh, before I throw over to you, Adam, I've just been told that unfortunately we can't see you. So what I'll do is I'll just try and pull you up on the screen here. That's probably a good thing, to be honest, Jeff. <laughs> there we go. So hopefully you're on screen now, Adam. And, and look, uh, before we dive into things, um, a bit of background on yourself. Um, yeah, please dig in. Tell us as, as much or as little about yourself as possible. Uh, thanks, Jack. Uh, good evening, everyone. Or good morning or whatever it might be. Um, okay, background on myself. Um, from a work perspective, um, I've been in the industry, the finance industry in different sorts for 25 years first 20 of that 19 of that was in the corporate side of it and then started this business six years ago um, the business that we we run today is uh, a finance a mortgage broking business that totally specializes in expats um, 90 percent roughly of our clients are on uh, are anywhere in the world but not in australia However, the majority of them are Australians, so all married to an Australian, some along those lines. Uh, it's quite interesting when we look at where our clients are actually based. So historically, we were very, very strong in Hong Kong and uh, pre-COVID used to go to Hong Kong a lot, Singapore, quite a lot of clients in the Middle East. Um, but we have clients in Europe, we have clients in North America, um, a few other random places. Argentina is a place we have some clients. Um, but interestingly, we don't have a client in New Zealand. So take that as you would. And uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Interesting, so yeah. Really, Kiwis don't want to buy or Australians that are over there don't want to buy back in, 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 in Australia, which is really, really interesting. So yeah, but uh, outside of that, um, other than work, you probably pick up from the picture on the wall behind me. Uh, my passion is sailing um, and family. So yeah, at, when I'm not working, um, chances are I'm either on a boat, on a bike, or um, maybe on a ski trip somewhere. Lovely. Too much of that at the moment. There we go. Perfect. Look, that's a uh, a great introduction, and, and, and thanks for that. And, and I guess it's probably time to, to delve into the, the crux of of why we're here tonight. And and I think the first place to start, and and probably the reason why most people are tuning in tonight, is is really to chat about you know accessing financing from from abroad so firstly as an expat can you access funds in australia luckily yes or we wouldn't be it'd be a very very short seminar um, or discussion but um realistically so yeah look absolutely um every lender we we have 40 45 46 different lenders that we look at the majority of those are banks 
um, there's probably 40 banks and five or six non-bank lenders where they're specialist lenders. Now, out of all of those lenders, not everyone will loan to an expat. So that really, that, that field narrows down to 12 or 14 lenders pretty quickly. And out of those 12 or 14 lenders, we then look at which lender matches the needs of the client um, or which client matches the rules of the lender, more to the point. Amazing. And I guess, is there anything, uh, I mean, we'll get to the crux of it as, as we go on, but uh, in particular, um, I guess, is, is PAYG preferred over self-employed, um, you know, as a, I guess, a starting point where we are looking at those, those kind of, um, you know, uh, reasons of, of accessing funds from abroad. What, what, what do they kind yeah. of look for on a more micro level? What do um, we... Look, from a high, high level, um, yeah, you, you've hit the nail on the head there. There, there isn't, there's no appetite at the moment from the banks to loan to self-employed clients overseas. So then when we are looking at a self-employed client, which, to be honest, we, we don't actually come across that many um, Australians who are self-employed overseas. The majority tend to be employed, but that's not always the case. Um, we do have some that are you know, fairly significant business owners, etc., um, whatever that might be, we do have lenders that we can go to. So um, we have non-bank lenders who will loan in that space. For me, the critical element of if we have a, um, an employed or a self-employed client is, is to really start with looking at the structure of um, what the lender's requirements are and, and how we then go along that route to see what is the optimum position for the client to see, you know, um, who will loan them the amount of money, who will loan the money in which client's name, um, what are the rules around putting a name in a particular title's name. And, and that's really around um, tax avoidance. So we don't like our clients paying too much tax. Um, tax avoidance is, is legal, tax evasion is illegal. So we just try and keep on the, on the legal side and, and make sure that client doesn't get a surprise when they suddenly turn around and say, oh, we've bought this property and I said, okay, right. So we, we try and preempt things and we try and really say, how is that going to affect? So a, a good example of that would be a client that um, is married. One party isn't an Australian and one is an Australian and making sure that the property is owned in the Australian's name, even if we have the loan in joint names. And the simple reason for that is stamp duty. Um, yeah. That if you've got an, a non-Australian on the title, then there's potential for a stamp duty excess and 7%, an additional 7% on top of the, um, the normal stamp duty rate for 50% of the property value can be quite significant. Definitely, especially when you're uh, yeah, considering all the, the purchasing costs already from abroad. And I guess, yeah. you know, when we talk about these challenges um, from, from that high level perspective, what other factors kind of, uh, you know, do the banks look at to, to, to really kind of narrow in and decide whether they are actually going to um, give you any capital to, to start with? So the starting point from, from any lender is, is it's all about the maths. So it's income versus expenses, assets, liabilities, um, and, and everything comes down to numbers. Every lender has its own formula. Uh, if we talk about you know, the, the standard formula that's used by many lenders is to look at someone's income and they'll take your, your gross income, they'll convert it to Aussie dollars, they'll then discount it 20%, so they'll only use 80%, but the kicker that really, really affects a lot of people is that then they will apply Australian tax. And the, the logic behind doing that is that if you apply Australian tax, if the client was to return home, then they would be paying Australian tax. So we need to factor that in because the argument from a bank's perspective is if you're doing a particular job overseas and you came back and did the same job, chances are your salary would be roughly the same. Um, but in reality, you'll be paying tax on shore. So they want to make sure and the responsible lending rules that you're in a position that you could afford that debt if you did come back. Um, now, there's not every lender does that, but the majority do. And you, know, you then get into other, other aspects of someone's, um, the, the makeup of their salary. So you know, if you, a lot of expats receive bonuses. 
So they will doubly discount a bonus. So they'll shave it by 20% and then they'll shave it by a further 20%. So you can imagine that when you have take your gross income, if you then discount it 20%, you add your bonus in, which has got double discount, then you apply Australian tax. Now, if you're in a region like the Middle East where um, you pay no tax, then you, if you look at the gross income of a client in the Middle East compared to what the, the number that a lender will look at, it's probably close to 50% of the actual income. So it makes a significant difference to um, being able to demonstrate affordability for the loan. So when we look at affordability, we take the lender's version of your gross income or your net income, sorry, and we then discount, or then we, um, we then deduct the expenses. So key expenses, rent, school fees, living expenses, and when you take those out, the surplus, whatever is left, that's how much we've got to um, basically work out how much we can afford a loan. One positive on, on those numbers is we do get to add in rental income to the equation. So um, it gets discounted as well. Most lenders discount it 25%, but we still get to add it back in to some degree. So that number that's left is how much we have to play with. Now, there's probably a couple of things that we do do in that. So we look quite closely at employment contracts um, and pay slips to see really how um, a client's income is actually derived. So a, a, a classic example of that would be the old style um, salary packages or the package, an expat package, where there's a base income, there's a bonus, there's uh, a housing expense, there's school fees paid. Now, if we have those things as separate items on a pay slip and they match the cost, we can then re basically um, remove them from the equation. The benefit of removing them is if we don't remove them, that number is getting taxed. So et cetera, et cetera, discounted and taxed. So if someone's paying, you know, living in Hong Kong, we, we have a huge number of clients in Hong Kong um, and, you know, they've got rent expense or school fees Singapore is the same Singapore the school fees are astronomical so if we can take those out of someone's income as gross instead of net then there are certain lenders we can go to that will allow us to do that not every lender so all of these factors will drive us to a particular lender or a particular two or three lenders so in reality we we usually end up with a scenario it's rare that we suddenly look at it and go okay well, we've got six lenders here to choose from it's usually two or three and then we then start looking at rate we look at features um, and we look at which which lender will um, provide the best long-term solution for the client yeah perfect and i think you know we, we've touched on the the location and, and i guess the tax rates of those those locations of, of where those expats are based but is there any i guess preferred currency from the banks that, that they they like and, and on the flip side um that they don't like that that i wouldn't say would rule them out immediately because there's always i guess rules to the exception but um from i guess from your standpoint there's, there's probably ones that are preferable and, and ones yeah. that aren't um, lenders, and that's a really, really good question because a lot of lenders do have a very specific list of um, current suits that they will do. Um, CBA, biggest lender in Australia, only last year included dirham um, in the UAE as a currency that they would loan on. So um, the major currencies, and there are six or seven currencies, which is US dollar, Hong Kong dollar, Singapore dollar, Canadian dollar, euro, pound, and yen. So those seven currencies are the main seven, seven currencies that we, we have to deal with. Outside of that, then there's obviously a lot of, that, a lot of other currencies. Um, those currencies, you tend to find that the, a lender will maybe discount the currency harder. So you know the, the salary will get, instead of having a 20% discount when we convert it, they'll actually discount it 30%. So if someone's in Thailand earning Thai baht, we, we can find a lender, but the lender won't see it as a, um, an A-level, if you like, uh, currency. They have, they have two tiers, and the bottom tier may, may have a, um, a lower amount that we can use of that currency. 
it makes perfect sense. And, and I guess that that's uh, quite relevant, you know, to, to, to our client base as well, being expats literally all across Absolutely. the world. So. Clients can be anywhere. And the other factor in there, I mean, if you think about all the different cities that we have clients around the world, you know, um, the, the cost of living of a client in Singapore, Hong Kong, Paris, London, New York, is very, very different to the cost of living of someone in um, Bangkok, um, in Phnom Penh, in you know a whole range of other currencies, uh, countries, and the, the 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 issue there we we face is Australian lenders will look at pay slips, they'll look at actual cost of livings, but they will have a floor, and the floor is the Australian cost of living. So, you know, we, we have clients in um, Bangkok. And, you know, a client there, the cost of living for a, a two bedroom, no, sorry, a, a, two, a couple with two kids could be, you know, three, $2,000, $2,500 a month, whereas we have to actually expense it at nearly 4500 a month. So there are other factors that come into play when we actually look. So they're not taking actual. The other key thing there is they actually, a, a, a lender can't credit search you in another country. Um, Interestingly, interesting. they, yeah, interestingly, the, the bigger lenders don't actually ask for your credit report. Um, small lenders tend to. So small boutique lenders will actually ask for a copy of your credit report. So, you know, in, in, in a foreign country. And that's their only way of checking to see what debt you've got that potentially you're not disclosing to them. So um, that in itself is quite interesting. But what it means is the documents that we do provide to them they forensically go through and, and I, I kid you not when I say forensically so they will go through three months bank statements so the, the requirement for a lender in documents would be um, if you're employed they want to see your last three months pay slips so they want your copy of your employment contract uh, a letter from your employer stating you're still employed three months pay slips and then three months bank statements showing that pay being deposited and they actually check through to make sure all four match. And if they don't match, it raises a question and we have to answer the question. What gets quite interesting is when they then look at your bank statements and they say, wow, okay. And they look at credit card statements and they'll look through them all and they'll say, well, you've disclosed that your, your cost of living is $5,000 a month, but you're spending $15,000 a month here consistently. So we have a disconnect. Why do we have a disconnect? So we really have to um, be careful of you know, what, what we're disclosing and what's real and what, what are, you know, consistent expenses rather than um, one-off expenses. I suppose the positive at the moment with COVID is people aren't traveling much. They're not spending, you know, most clients, uh, we're not seeing um, massive expenses that they're suddenly having to disclose. So it's a very yeah. different, it's been a different period over the last yeah. 12 months because of that. Most certainly. And I guess when we look at, at factoring in, you know, the currency shading is, as I guess you, you, you would call it as well as, mm. um, you know, what country that, that we're looking at from a taxation point of view um, on a more micro level, once we start actually, I guess, securing that, that capital, um, what are we starting to look at on a micro level from, you know, a deposit standpoint? Um, are we looking at it at a higher um, than what, what we might see as a, as a local once we kind of progress through that journey? Where do we kind of see yeah. with, with that, I so guess? Is for a borrower in Australia, um, if the loan is over 80%, then you, pay, you, you can pay lenders mortgage insurance and take a loan up to 95%. Uh, as an expat, the, no um, lenders will take you into lenders mortgage and territory. CBA will to some degree, but um, they're, they're pretty well the only one. And that's only up by 5% or so. So as a general rule, most, um, most lenders will loan only 70% to an expat. Some will go to 80. Um, and you know, so, so realistically you need 20 or 30% of the property value plus stamp duty um, as a, an amount of money to consider trying to get into that property so um, or whichever property so yeah that that becomes another factor in the equation to which lender we would go to um, the other key factors around that affordability so we've looked at income but on the expense side you know i touched touched on the key expenses that are physical expenses the other things that lenders look at is if you have 
debt in Australia already, um, they will actually look at a mortgage and they'll expense it over a particular term, so um, which is the remaining term. Now, if you've taken out a, a loan pretty recently and it's a 29 year term to go, a new lender that you're going to, say we went to one lender for one and we're going to a, a different lender for whatever reason for a second loan, um, then the new lender will expense the previous loan at 25 years, not 29 years, which increases the capital cost quite significantly. So that affects the affordability. But the biggest thing that I find with clients is credit cards. So particularly in Asia, credit card limits, I mean, they just keep going up and up and up. And a credit card, lim a credit card is assessed on its limit. It's not assessed on its usage. So a lender will take 4% of the limit um, a month off your cash flow. So, you know, I, I've seen some, uh, the worst, not worst, worst is probably not the way, best way to put it, but the most significant situation I ever saw was a couple who had 11 credit cards between them with a combined limit <laughs> of nearly 600,000 Australian dollars. And they had no idea they had that. They just saw it. When I actually put it in on paper, they went, oh my goodness, because it just gets increased and increased and increased. And um, yeah, so, you know, you think about that, at, you know, that's a significant amount of money a month out. So we end up chopping up some cards, reducing limits down. And the reality is they've taken on the cards to get sign-on bonuses for frequent flyer points, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and we're all guilty of trying to do that as much as we can, but Realistically, a credit card can be quite um, a significant issue when um, when we look at that. The other one is a tax loan. So in some of the Asian countries particularly, people take out a, a tax loan to pay their tax once a year um, and a tax loan because it's expensed over one year. A lender doesn't look at it as being, this is your way of paying tax. They look at it as this is a debt. And you know it can be a significant debt in somewhere like Hong Kong. So. Um, different factors in different places. That's on, the, that's on the side of a, a country where the tax regime is lower than Australia, but on the other side where a tax regime is higher, for example, the UK, um, we also then hit certain issues. So in the UK, you have tax and national insurance. So national insurance is effectively the same as um, Medicare and super guarantee combined, or you know, not super guarantee, but you know, basic super combined. Um, and it's quite significant. So I think it's 9%. So a lot of lenders will look at that as a, as a voluntary contribution or, or an, an, an optional cost. Well, it's not, it's a tax, um, but they will take it on top of the tax as another deduction. So if you take just UK tax, that's lower than Australians. So they'll apply Australia tax and then they'll apply that on top. So it's like a double whammy. So all of these factors go into the equation of trying to work out which lender will provide the best possible outcome for the client. Interesting. Yeah. A lot to, uh, a lot to unpack there. And I guess on a even more micro level there, when we start looking at the, the, the rates for expats, how do they compare, I guess, to, to, to locals? Are they in line on par? Are they higher? Um, they're assumingly not lower. So yeah. Yeah, well, no. Um, look, something that happened um, probably five or six years ago um, in Australia was lenders started factoring in risk or perceived risk to interest rates. So we go back seven or eight years ago, and it didn't matter what the loan was um, or the type and the classification of the loan, the interest rate was exactly the same. So if you had uh, an investment loan or an owner-occupied loan, it was the same rate. If you were paying principal and interest or interest only was the same rate. Whereas in today's market, um, risk is factored in. So risk from a lender perspective, a lender sees someone's owner occupied home as their lowest possible risk because people have got to live somewhere. So they'll do everything they can to pay their mortgage. So from a, the perspective, from a lender's perspective of um, who's more likely to default on a loan, the, the, lowest risk and the best possible interest rate would be an owner-occupied principal and interest loan. The next best would be owner-occupied interest only. Next 
would be uh, an investment loan that's principal and interest. And then the last one would be an investment loan that is interest only. And it can be, you know, from one end to the other is 1% difference. So, you know, a, an investment loan to an owner-occupied loan can be, you know, 40, 50 basis points, 0 0.5 to 0 0.4 difference, or more significant with some lenders. Yeah, definitely. And I guess that over the long term can really uh, be impact for the amount, you know, you are paying back in, as mentioned, the, 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 the long term. And I guess... It's, it's all about the maths. It's, 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 yeah. it's, it's still an investment. You guys do the spreadsheets. It's all about an investment and making sure the numbers do provide a return. So, you know, it's, it's and I think a really big factor. Taking a step back from that as well, you were mentioning, I guess, the types of loans. We've got the own occupier or the, the PPO uh, loans, and then you've got the investment ones. Um, I guess taking a, a step right back, did you maybe want to distinguish the, the, the types there and, and how they differentiate? Um, yeah, look, I mean, obviously the purpose of the loan. So um, as an expat, um, it's quite hard to, we, we do actually do it sometimes, which is, and to be honest, we haven't done it in the last 12 months. Um, it's quite hard to justify why you're buying an owner-occupied property in Australia at the moment if you're living overseas. So we have in the past had some clients who bought um, a holiday house or an apartment as a, a second home in Australia. And if we didn't need rental income, we were able to do it. At the moment, it's very difficult to do that because people can't actually come home um, very easily to to actually um, go to that property. Um, so as a general rule, most of the loans we're doing are investment loans. They're not owner occupied. It used to be about the maths. Could we justify it? Um, the other issue, and, and this is quite a significant factor for a lot of clients at the moment, is a lot of clients are actually calling us and they're saying, okay, we want to buy the property and we're actually going to move back in six to 12 months. Now, that's something that we don't necessarily want to disclose to the lender because that's higher risk. Because if you do move back, what you're actually going to be doing work-wise, can you afford the loan? Is there a significant, one of the boxes you tick on an application board form is, is there a significant change coming? Well, relocating back to Australia, that could be quite a significant change for some people <laughs> because no one moves back with a job. It's, you know, I, I had a conversation today with someone, it's exactly that situation. They're buying a property and going to move back and not sure what they're going to be doing work-wise for a period of time. So we have to factor that into the maths. So um, one thing we do do is if someone is going to be back, we have an interesting position in, in, in the, the market at the moment with interest rates is historically fixed rates have been higher than variable rates. And the reason for that is markets you know, are expecting rates to go up. Now, if you read the press at the moment, some of the lenders are saying, some of the economists are saying that we think Australian rates will go up maybe late next year or in 2023, the RBA is saying 2024. You know, their crystal ball is better than mine. Or, you know, but one thing's for sure, we can't really see interest rates coming down from where we are at the moment because there's nowhere to go. We're at 40%. Yeah. So, um, but when you have... Um, a three-year fixed rate that is half percent lower than a variable rate, you know significantly that's, that's, that's pretty major. So that's unusual position. So quite a lot of clients will say, well, let's go into the fixed rate. Now, if they're going to move back and they're going to move into the property, then we actually want to be in a variable rate when they do move back. So that timing of how long we fix, do we fix one year, two year, three year, four years, um, is, is really, really important because if you fixed it for three years as an investment loan and the client moves back in 12 months, we then can't reclassify uh, the loan for two years. And by reclassifying the loan, we can go to a cheaper loan. So uh, these are all factors that come out in, in, in the overall bigger picture of the plan of exactly what we do loan-wise. We can split fixed and variable, but we can't reclassify. And the interesting thing when you reclassify a loan is you're not reassessed. So the lender doesn't look at the maths of because you can you afford the loan because you're already there. Um, they simply just want you know, pay a, a bank, not a bank statement, sorry, um, 
a copy of your ID and an electricity bill, something like that. So driver's license has it on, electricity bill, they, they'll reclassify it and reduce the interest rate and they'll change it to an annual occupied loan. Interesting. And I guess to tie into that question, uh, people that own existing property in Australia with mortgages mm. already on that, um, uh, talk me through the process with that, I guess, and, and you know what potential OVRs can you look at with that? Um, does that affect deposit amounts if you are looking at potentially taking out a, a, a second, second mortgage and so on and so forth? Yep. Um, the, I suppose, that, you know, following on from what the, the previous part of that conversation, if, if someone has left their family home in Australia, rented it out and gone overseas, then that loan could be classified as an owner-occupied loan still and be a lower interest rate. Now, interestingly, lenders are notorious for um, really not looking after their existing clients. So quite often in that situation, we'll find that we could go to an investment loan with another lender at a far better rate than staying with the existing lender even if it's on an owner-occupied rate, because they're not willing to discount for existing clients, which to me is ridiculous, but we, we don't drive lender policy, they drive their own policies on that. Um, but we do have a lot of clients where they've got a property, they're building a portfolio and they come back and say, okay, we wanna buy another property. How do we do that? How do we structure the loan? We've saved X amount. Um, we, Sometimes we keep the properties completely separate. We pull money and, and we just buy another property. The savings are there. Other times we actually utilize the equity in the existing property, put the two titles together, the properties together and move forward and buy another property and buy the, the second property with that or the third or the fourth or the fifth, whichever it might be. Um, it, it's all an individual. Um, so it depends on the goals, aspirations of the client as in how we structure the debt. So sometimes we'll pull money out of a property to go to a new property. Sometimes we'll put the titles together and just do a new, new loan. But the key is we can utilize equity in an existing property to buy a, a new property. So living overseas doesn't impact the ability to, to do that as if you're no, living locally? Not, not at all. No, it's, it's um, all to do with the valuation, rental income, goes back to the, the maths of the equation. Yeah, and the crux of it all, which is accessing funds from abroad, I guess. And and I guess a lot of people, you know, probably hopefully after um, listening to the insights you've, you've provided so far, um, would now be asking, you know, what's the starting point? How do you actually, you know, what, what, what is point A of this, uh, what I can imagine to be quite quite an uh, intricate process and, and how yeah. would they get started? So, um but our starting point is to sit down with a client over a Zoom call like this and, and just have a pretty open conversation. What are the goals and aspirations? What are they actually trying to achieve? Um, we'll drill into the maths of, of, of what we can do numbers wise. But for me, it's actually more important to look at the structure of what we're trying to do to make sure we're not creating something that could be a problem down the track. Um, in, you know, do we link properties together? Do we not? Um, where are we going to buy? How, one of my first questions nowadays is how are you going to transact? Do you know, Are they going to employ the service of someone like yourself, um, a buyer's agency, to do that? Because you can't just get on a plane and come home now to do this, which is really challenging because people have tried to do that before. So um, how are they going to transact? But once we work out that someone, yes, does want to, they're definitely going to buy a property, um, before they start looking to buy a property we actually go to a lender and we work out how much a lender will loan us so we gain what we call a pre-approval and a pre-approval is simply saying to a lender here is the client here's the client's information here's their financial position um, here's a copy of their lease employment contracts pay slips bank statements here's the picture and we we give them all the documentation around a picture of the client we then explain the objective of the client to the lender. So we tell them and we try and preempt any questions that might come up. So um, we, we, we tell fairly intricate stories around the client's life and the situation and, and, and the reason they want, what they're trying to do. So what we actually effectively want to do is we know the types of questions that a lender is going to ask or an assessor is going to look for 
So we try and answer the questions before they actually get asked. So the goal is to have a pre-approval in place for X amount of dollars that the client can then go away, find a property, engage with someone to help them find the property. Um, so when they do enter a contract, we can then turn a contract in, uh, I suppose, a, a pre-approval into an actual loan um, once you've got a contract. So we get the property valued and we convert it across. And it's only at that point that we start looking at product type. Do you need an offset account? Do you need a redraw account? Do you want a fixed rate? Do you want a variable rate? All of those factors go in. And the last part is what is the best rate? And the reason the what is the best rate is the very, very last part is we generally negotiate with the lenders pretty hard for the client. We represent the client. We do not represent the lender. So, you know, what we find is that most lenders will um, negotiate to their own peer group. So if you have a, one of the big four banks, they will match the rates of the big four banks if we are with the next tier down, which is probably the, the tier we prefer to work with of lenders. So um, if we look at those lenders, we're looking at St. George, we're looking at Citibank, um, Macquarie, Suncorp, uh, Bank West, Bank of Queensland, Gateway, and a few other lenders. So there's, there's this group of lenders that we'll look at there. Now, they all match their own peer group, which is all the banks in that, that space. Now, they are the most competitive banks in the market, by, by none. So they, for a variable rate at the moment, for an investment variable rate, would be 30 or 40 basis points cheaper than one of the big four. So they're the same on fixed rates, but not on variable. So if we know they're going to match their peer group, then we don't know which one's going to have the best rate on the day that you sign a contract. So we may gain a pre-approval with St. George, but we find out that um, Citibank's got the best interest rate on the day you sign the contract. But if we know we put some pressure on St. George, they will match Citibank. Bob's your uncle, we get the really good rate out of them that way. So that's why the rate becomes the last factor in the equation rather than the first factor in the equation. And what we find is most people are, oh, well, what's the rate, what's the rate? And so, yeah no idea what the rate is you know what's the property we we don't know the loan amount we don't know whether a fixed rate or a variable rate is going to be appropriate yet we don't know what the blending is going to be how much should we fix how much should we leave as variable what are the expected bonuses going to be over the next three years how much do you expect to pay off when do you want to buy the next property all of these factors go in to that last part of the equation which is fixed versus variable and cheapest rate, offset account, all those things. And what are you looking at at the moment in terms of lead time for a, a pre-approval? Because, I mean, there's, there's quite a bit in the media of, you know, a lot of uh, yes. Lenders. A, a heated housing market and as such quite a few people um, yeah, looking looking into, you know, securing funding. So is it a, an extended lead time? Obviously it comes down to, you know, um, obvious factors such as uh, getting the required paperwork together. But yeah. uh, from your end, are you experiencing, you know, um, any delays at the moment or is it kind of in line with what you've seen historically? What, what are we looking at in that respect? All lenders are at record numbers this year and have been in, in new business. So um, they're all struggling. The majority are struggling with um, timeframes. So it's a couple of the lenders. We, some, some are coming back in slowly. Um, you know, some lenders are out at five or, uh, four or five weeks to pick up a file. So when we, from the date we submit to them actually reviewing it can be up to five weeks, which is appalling. And the industry is saying it's appalling. And, and those lenders are saying it's appalling, but they can't get themselves back to a reasonable time frame. Um, as a general rule, if we if we were doing it this in January, you know, we could get pre-approval in a week. Um, I would say now it's probably two weeks, in, in some cases three, depending on the lender. But we'll know when we apply what that time frame is. And, and quite often we'll actually say to the client, now once we have applied, start the process, find a property. Because if you find a property, we can generally um, work within the guidelines of- Work, work in tandem. Offer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so we can try and bring that in, but it's not just on that side. So, um, 
quite often at the moment we're you know maybe doing a refinance as part of the equation where we'll raise some funds to do the next now um we had one going to cba two days ago where the loan documents came back and they notified us that they would review the loan documents that have been returned in three weeks time and they find that's acceptable well personally i don't you know that's appalling but they think you know that's fine unless there's a reason they can do it sooner but that just shows the volume of business that you should be at three days um they're at three weeks and you know so you go through the pre-approval process you then go through the approval process loan documents go out to the client you've quite often with some states you've got to go to a consulate to get signed now um, we had a situation a couple of weeks ago where the client was um, buying a couple of properties and they're in wa now with wa you have to sign mortgage documents at the consulate you have no other options this is the only option for an australian signing mortgage documents and when the client called the embassy in cairo he was told he couldn't get an appointment for three three months right so but we had settlement you know four weeks later <laughs> so yeah okay so he he then um fortunately was able to uh, spend an, uh, about two hours on the phone to a particular department in Canberra, um, who they eventually managed to get him um, a, uh, an appointment at the, the Cairo Embassy and uh, at the consulate. And um, we then had the rush to try and get both sets of loan documents to him. And I think we got them there 40 minutes before he had to leave the office. It, it was just ridiculous. I was impressed that the lender actually got it through in the time frame that we had an email to him printed signed and they came back so yeah so it can be done but um it, it's managing those time frames is, is is quite an issue at times and in terms of pre-approvals how long do they typically last for is it three months six months what are you saying is it is it dependent on the yeah, product so it depends, on, depends on the lender so most lenders are three months 90 days um there's a couple at four months and there's a couple at six months and the ones at six months they, as a general rule, um, need more documents after three months. So payslips, bank statements, we just update those and they go, or, or what, a couple of them, you actually don't. You just, when you turn it into a, a formal approval, they want the additional documents. But as a matter of course, we tend to send those in anyway. So if the pre-approval is two months old, we would send payslips, updated payslips and bank statements because they always Bing. reserve the right to ask for them so we might as well just give them and then it's otherwise better be proactive than, than reactive right we haven't got time you know if it's yeah. new south wales we have five days to turn a pre-approval into a loan um victoria new south victoria if it's an auction when the hammer falls anyway when the hammer falls you own it so we need to make sure that the pre-approval is bulletproof and with states where we can put a finance clause in, which sometimes is Vic. Western Australia usually the finance, um, Queensland is usually a finance clause. With those places, we have a seven or 14 day finance clause, which takes the pressure off to some degree, um, but not always. So you know, at times it can take us a week to get a valuation back. Interesting, yeah. It's, uh, it's an incredible wait time when you think about it for, um, for, for you know, even just looking at the, those documents. So I guess it's, it's pretty critical to make sure that every uh, T is, is crossed and, and I dotted um, to make sure that nothing's sent back and, and Absolutely. you have to go through that process again. So look, I think we've covered um, the majority of things that I think we had discussed beforehand and, and hopefully that's provided a really good insight to, to those that have tuned in and, and will be viewing it um, post this. And, and I guess it's now time if, if anyone, you know, did have some, some questions um, that you would like to ask Adam directly. Uh, you can chat them in the, the, the box. I do believe it's down there. Um, now we've already got one from Hayden that, that um, I'll put to you, Adam, and, and that's that, that Hayden's an expat, um, but he's considering if he could get a loan in joint names with uh, his brother who is a resident in Australia. Um, would that be feasible to get first and foremost? How would that work in terms of the amount we could borrow? Um, uh, his LTV is, is still capped, but his brother could have a higher LTV potentially. Yeah, it's a really, really good question, Hayden. Um, the 
the lender would base it on both incomes. Um, so uh, your brother's income, if it's in Australia, isn't discounted, but yours obviously is. Um, the maximum LVR would still be 80% as a general rule. We, we can't go over that, even though your brother's onshore. Um, the, you'd have to look at um, expensing. The, the challenge is you have to then expense two households because there's two applicants, they're not living together. So you're expensing two, so expenses tend to be higher. Um, but yeah, no, it can definitely be done. Uh, it's really then the case of just following through the process and making sure the maths work of, of whatever. Still an 80% LVR is, is the maximum that we can get to. I'm just thinking actually through that, that um, and I've never done this, um, but what if your brother's self-employed and you're employed or vice versa, how that throws into the equation? Um, and that could be quite an interesting one because as a general rule, lenders won't do a loan where one of the party is self-employed. Um, but if the self-employed is onshore, then I, I, think, I think we'd certainly be able to find a lender who would do that on normal rates. So yeah. Interesting. It's, okay. Kind of playing game. Yeah. Well, hopefully that uh, answers uh, your question, Hayden, and, and we've gone from an anonymous attendee, um, which is buying in one state versus another one. Um, is there any implications to accessing a lender um, or to the mortgage or lenders don't really care where you're buying? Yeah, that's, yeah, again, good. Um, lenders really, they, they generally don't care where you're buying. Um, they, there are limitations on property types and the location of the property. So regional, rural areas, size of properties and things like that. Um, but state to state for capital um, or major center, um, big cities, you know, if that's Geelong, Toowoomba, um, what would that be the equivalent? Wollongong, Newcastle. Yeah. So those big locations is, is never an issue. Um, the next tier down, so if we were looking at Coffs Harbour, for example, um, that for some lenders may be an issue, but um, generally not. And in fact, there are a couple of lenders who we, if the client is buying in WA, um, the, a big lend, some big lenders have state-based teams um, in each state. Now, uh, one, one big lender um, who, who will remain nameless have teams in every state. So if you put an application for a pre-approval in to do in, a loan in WA, it would go to the WA state and their state team. Now, when we do a lot of business with some lenders, we get to know their teams quite well. And um, so with that particular lender, if someone wants to buy in WA, we will put a notional property in Queensland because we know then it gets assessed by the Queensland team rather than the WA team who are far more stringent and strict in their interpretation of rules for expats. So we tend to sort of work uh, lenders a bit like that. If you like them, work's probably not the right way of doing it, but it's just being aware of the last thing we want is a, a hold up. And, and, and this does happen. We've, we've had this situation recently with one lender who we just hit a brick wall. And it was with um, an assessor who was looking at someone in the UK's income and saying, well, no, national insurance isn't a tax and it's an additional deduction. Um, and it, we, we challenged it with that lender because he declined the loan. And we said, well, this is ridiculous. Uh, when we declined the loan, we then went to his superior. Um, this assessor happened to be in WA and his superior is WA. And the, the superior backed him up and said, no, no that's fine. Um, and we have, don't have a problem with that. And then that particular end has a, another channel we can then still challenging on. And there are reasons we actually had to go to that lender. We didn't have many other options. They didn't know that. But um, it then went to their, um, what they call their declines team. So they haven't actually, this lender actually has a team of people who deal with applications that are declined. And when I spoke to the, the um, assessor who called to talk it through um, and we talked through the issues, she was blown away by the fact that it had been declined. She goes, that's appalling. That's ridiculous. Uh, and she goes, it should never have been declined. And I just went, I know. Um, but it's just the, the, the education level and knowledge level of some of the assessors. It was a particularly new assessor to that level of um, complexity, to deal with it. complexity of an expat case. Yeah. 
So yeah. one thing we do see is expats applications as a general rule are assessed by the most senior assessors in each institution. So we get to know those people. And, and you know, we, we apply to a particular lender and the assessor <laughs> comes on the phone, you usually have a five minute conversation about the dogs, the cats, the family, the holiday they've just been on before you actually get to conversation. So you do actually quite bizarrely develop relationships with these people. That's just right. a name on a bit of paper and a, a voice at the end of the phone. But um, yeah, interesting. But by doing that, they actually, we understand what they're looking for as individuals um, on top of what the lender rules are. Which is which is really useful. Highly beneficial, I can can imagine. Mm. Perfect. Well, I hope that one, uh, yeah, answers answers that question sufficiently. Um, I guess the next one that we have is is probably a bit more complex, but it's again from an, another anonymous attendee, um, and basically, yeah, ask, can you discuss the complexities around construction financing and, and what the general process around that is? Okay, so with a construction loan. Um, we, you know, as a gen, the, the general process is to buy a block of land, whether it's got a rental property or not on on, but you buy a block of land first and we do a loan for the, to, for the purchase of the land. Once the land is in place, we then go down the, you, you then go down the process of designing the property, um, finalizing a fixed price contract with the builder and the builder would then prepare the contracts to go to the council and get the approvals to build the property with the councils. When that's done, or once it's been lodged with the council, I can then take the, um, the, the build contract and the property and take it to a, a valuer, a bank's value. We choose a lender, we go to the bank's valuer and we say to the valuer, value this property as if it had been completed. Now it might be 12 months away, but they will value it as if it was built and it was there. What we can then do is we can then borrow up to, let's say, 80% of that value less the current loan. Now, the loans have to be with the same lender. So sometimes we may end up refinancing, moving the debt across if we have a problem with the lender, um, or we go back to the same lender and do a second loan with that. So there's a few factors there, um, but the key part of it from our perspective is everything is based on the final valuation. Now we can also include proposed rental income. So we can get a rental appraisal and rental appraisals, $500 a week, whatever. And we can add that into the maths of the of, of gaining the second loan. Interesting. So it is quite complex at the end of the day, but it is, yeah, uh, it is, it is, it is doable and, yeah. and, and able to be tied in with that, that primary mortgage. But the key thing is the loan is based on the valuation, not the contract price. So we, we have one at the moment that uh, I'm actually doing with, with Milk Chocolate and one of the clients and the valuation came back um, the, where the, um, the, the client had bought the property about 12 months ago and the property's increased in value. We're not doing a massive extension, but they're putting another room on. It's hundred and I think it was $122,000, the build. Um, and when we looked at, the new valuation, we could borrow 80% of that. And the difference between the old loan and the new loan, we could borrow $120,000. So that out of pocket, the client was only out of pocket two grand. Um, so they were able to increase the loan amount, increase the rental income significantly, all, all, all for effectively two grand out of pocket. So, all right. I think uh, one of the final questions that we'll get to it is answer. Is the it's most complex fun. question yeah. <laughs> um, right. So, so another anonymous attendee has, has presented no, right. again a complex um, one. Um, I'll, I'll read it out and then you can answer. Yeah, but go. basically, we uh, we have a question here that, that states that um, we are an Australian and non-Australian couple, but the non-Australian is the one with the income. Is it still okay to have a joint mortgage? Um, how would they look at this case? Can the title still be under the non-Australian to avoid the tax, as you mentioned earlier? Really, really good. This is this is the, um, I won't say bane of my life, but it's certainly one of the areas that this used to be really easy because there was a lender who would do this, one of the bank lenders who would do this really quite easily. 
Um, so all of our business went there for this situation. And it's remarkably common to find an Australian married to a non-Australian living as an expat looking to buy property back here. So every lender has its own rules. Um, now, the, the interesting factor here is that the non-Australian has the income or the, the more significant income. So if I look at the, the different lenders we use who will do this type of loan, so as a general rule, none, no Australian banks will assess the income of the non-Australian, except for one bank. And that one bank will, but they will, the, they will only do it if the couple are married and also that the non-Australian has permanent residency, even though they're not living here, so they have a PR visa. So if, if they fit that criteria, all well and good, we can go to that lender and go normal loan. Otherwise, we are then looking at what we call non-bank lenders. And non-bank lenders are um, securitization specialists or they're a, mor a mortgage manager who gets money from all sorts of weird and wonderful places, but they have a product. And there's probably four key ones that we deal with in this space. And each one has different rules. So um, the, the, there's one there that we deal with really well, that if the Australian has a higher income than the non-Australian, it fits one product with a normal interest rate. If it's the other way around, the interest rate is nearly 2% higher. Um, the last part, which is really, really critical, so um, which in, in the question was around the title. So the title for me is the starting point. We need a lender that we can go to who will allow the title to go in the Australian's name, but the loan to be in joint names. And a lot of lenders don't allow that. So um, I, I literally have a, a, an application sitting on my desk that I would lodge in the morning for this exact situation where um, the couple are in the UK and they're actually self-employed as well. So it gives another level of complexity. Um, and with that situation, we, we have to have, for me, that you know, we need to have the title in the Australian's name and the loan in joint names because they're both income earners. Um, now we were looking at a couple of different lenders and we looked at four different lenders in that space that would all potentially do it. Three of the lenders insisted on the non-Australian going on the title. It left us with one option and it was the most expensive option. But even though we went there, there's no penalties to leave that lender. So the couple are considering moving back within 12 months if they do, we would then relocate, we'd, we'd refinance the loan to a new lender. And the reality is, yes, the interest rate was probably one and a half percent higher for a year. One and a half percent higher on a one and a half million dollar loan isn't a lot compared to um, the stamp duty excess on a two and a half million dollar property. So two and a half million dollars of the property, half is owned by the non-Australian, which is 1.25, um, 7% of 1.25 is give or take, that's about uh, 90 odd thousand dollars, just under. Just so, say about that, yeah. Yep, yeah, eight, eight, and a half $87,500 tax bill by going to the wrong lender. Interestingly, with these clients, they have spoken to two different brokers. Um, one had gone to one lender, one had gone to the other, and they were still concerned and neither broker had brought up the subject about the title. So they had applications in both, they're battling along. And I said, well, wait a second, this isn't about rate, this is about title because you don't want the 70 grand bill, 80, 87 grand bill. Um, and I've seen situations where the bill came in on the settlement day and when they're going to settle, they had a 40, 50, 60, $70,000 bill that they just didn't know about because no one had raised it. The solicitor hadn't raised it. No one brought it up and the client didn't know. So yeah, it's, structure is really, really important and, and making sure the title is in the right names and not every lender will allow that. So it's a really, really so, big factor. So it is possible at the end of the day, it is just incredibly it's definitely complex. Possible. It's, it just adds a layer of complexity yeah. and it usually increases the, the cost. So usually we're going to a lender who will be flexible um, but there's a cost with doing that. 
um, you know, cost might be 1%, 1.5% 1 more, but the market might move 5% a year. So it's possibly better off to, to yeah. do it now. And, yeah. and, you know, for a lot of people, it's what we're seeing at the moment is it's a significant purchase and it's usually buying a family home where you're going to be moving back. If you're going to be moving back shortly, then we do look to refinance pretty quickly. And look, over the last, probably the hardest part in the market from the last five years was about three years ago. Um, and debt was really, really hard for non-Australians. And um, you know, people were buying off plan in Australia. I remember doing a few loans at seven and a half and eight percent. Um, and we, we're in the process now, and it took, took three years, but we're refinancing quite a lot of those loans down to 4% loans. Um, but the people who bought the properties, they wanted the investment, and you know, that was the only option we had at the time. So, um, yeah, so we're always monitoring, trying to find a better rate, trying to find a better lender. Um, the key is actually making sure if we go to a new lender, a different lender, sorry, when we do the initial loan, we make sure the lender we go to then we can actually leave without penalty. So, yeah, lots of factors, but lots yeah, of factors like everything, yeah. can be done. Lots of, lots of complexity, but can be done at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, that's the end of the, um, the Q and a or the questions that we had in the, the, the Q and a box. So I think, look, we've covered most things that again, that, that we set out, to, to hopefully achieve an answer. Um, if there were any further questions, please uh, feel free to reach out to myself via email. I can definitely ask for Adam's expert opinion on that. Um, Adam and, and, and myself, Milk Chocolate and, and Australian Expat Finance, that is work closely together. So any questions you do have, please feel free to reach out. Um, would like to also just thank you, Adam, for taking the time um, this evening Pleasure. to to have a, a discussion and a, a chat and, and provide some insight and um, and some clarity around what some may perceive to be quite a complex issue and, and try and hopefully um, untangle it a bit and and uh, make it not as scary as it, as it may seem on on first glance. So very much appreciated. Um, and uh, as mentioned at the start of this, I'll make sure this recording is sent out. And again, any further questions, please feel free to, to email after but thanks all for tuning in um have a wonderful evening day uh morning wherever you are and uh and we'll see you next month thanks very much thanks guys bye